Hey guys, check it out. That is a 2006 Land Rover LR3, and I'm here to tell you that that is one of the best SUVs you can buy for just $5,000. It's pretty incredible. And in this video, I'm going over all the really cool features that make it so special. And yes, we're going to talk about reliability because that is all anybody can ever talk about on the internet with Land Rover. So stay tuned. It's pretty incredible that you can buy a Land Rover LR3 fully kitted out, full seven seater, with all the luxury goodies and a V8 for just five grand. And one of the best parts of these cars is the design. Take a look at the overall exterior. It's just perfect. It's the best looking SUV, I think, in the entire world ever. And that's because it's squared off. Dear auto manufacturers, you can't go wrong building a square SUV. The Cherokee XJ, brilliant design, old Broncos, they look perfect, and the LR3 is ideal. Please, just go back to building an old school brick. They look brilliant. We're gonna start our list of really cool features with the key, which looks pretty standard, of course, being mid-2000s. Oh yes, look at that, it's a switchblade design, but it has a couple of cool things. First of all, you've got your standard lock and unlock, and then there is this mystery button at the bottom called Land Rover, which you probably didn't even realize was a button. But when you push that, a variety of things can happen. In this car, the rear hatch pops open, but I can program this to lower the air suspension for easy access, if I so desire, all from the key. And check this out. Back here, you'll notice this little auto battery, and that's because the key battery actually charges when you stick the key in the ignition, so there's no need to replace a battery. Older discoveries were solid axle, and they were great off-road, but on-road, they were a little bit compromised. Well, starting with the LR3, Land Rover shifted completely to air suspension and independent suspension. And what this means is this car drives really superbly on-road, but also drives incredibly off-road, because take a look at how high I can jack the air suspension up to. The air suspension, in my opinion, is the key to the magic of the LR3 because it means that this vehicle can cruise down the Autobahn at 110 miles an hour all day long in aero mode and then you can stop, jack it up to over 12 inches of ground clearance and cruise down some of the hardest off-road terrain you can imagine. It truly makes these vehicles unique and special, but it also gives them a terrible reputation because yes, everybody knows that when the Land Rover air suspension fails, it can be thousands of dollars. If you listen to some YouTube channels, hundreds of thousands of dollars, even millions to fix. That's how expensive it is. But once again, I really think a lot of this is blown completely out of proportion because the air suspension really isn't all that complicated. There's basically four balloons on each corner of the vehicle and a compressor that poofs up the balloons and then a few valves that'll let them kind of shrink down again when you're on the road. It's not all that complicated to set right. And the crazy thing is, is they can actually last a surprising amount of time if taken care of. So for example, this LR3 has 142,000 miles on it, and I crawled underneath the other day just to see how old the airbags were when they had been replaced. Never. 14 years old, it's been driven off-road constantly, constantly thrashed on, constantly been towed with, original air suspension on all four corners. That's pretty wild. What's it like to drive around in an LR3? Um, what's it like to drive around in an LR3? It's like if you could drive a 1975 Cadillac Eldorado up the side of a mountain. That's the best comparison I can make because this has the softest, most compliant ride I have experienced in any vehicle ever. It's berserk how soft and just buttery the driving experience in an LR3 is. The really interesting thing about driving these LR3s is there's no part of the driving experience that is even remotely sporty. Modern day SUVs are trying to be high performance and aggressive and track focused. The, the Land Rover is not like that whatsoever. The steering is slow, the suspension is soft, the brakes are a little bit squishy, but it's all driven toward absolute comfort. So if you try to take a corner at the, in this vehicle at like 35 miles an hour, whoa, it does definitely lean over quite a bit compared to something like an X5 or an ML or a GL. But that's not the point. This thing is just supposed to take you 
thousands of miles and isolate you from the entire world and it does that beautifully and that's something that just does not exist even in the modern day Land Rovers. Now the old Land Rover Discovery 2 we owned before this one had a lot of fundamental issues with the engine which made them notoriously unreliable. They constantly overheated, which took out head gaskets constantly, which would then fry the engine because the liners inside the cylinders would slip and the whole thing would go kaput. That was just an issue that plagued thousands of Discovery 2s. The LR3 has an entirely different engine. This is called the AJ V8, and it is a 4.4 liter naturally aspirated V8 that was used in many, many different models, ranging from Jaguars to Fords. Remember, Ford owned Land Rover in this era, including the Lincoln LS and the Thunderbird. And these engines are much, much, much better. These engines are actually known for going quite a long time without a lot of issues. You see a lot of LR3s with 150, 200, 250,000 miles on them with their original engines still intact, still humming along happily. So a lot of the big issues that gained Land Rover such a terrible reputation throughout the late 90s and the early 2000s were resolved when the LR3 came along in 2005. Now, 4.4 liter V8, you're probably thinking, ah, that's got to be pretty quick. It is not pretty quick. It is perfectly adequate. I'm going to floor it. Are you ready? No need to hold on. I would describe the acceleration as stately. It's just exactly the, the correct amount of power for the platform because any more and you'll fall off at suspension, any less and you're never going to make it to your destination in any kind of reasonable time. So definitely get the V8 if you get the LR3 because the 4 liter V6 is going to be a little pokey. Now, as I've mentioned many times in this video already, you can pick these Land Rovers up for five grand, but realistically it's between four and like six grand for a pretty good one. And for four to six thousand dollars, the amount of comfort and leather and cool features you get on the inside of an LR3 is just absurd. A lot of aspects inside the LR3 still look new even 14 years later in terms of design. And I'm talking stuff like the steering wheel. This is just a classic timeless design. I love the big center Land Rover airbag in the middle here with buttons along the side for your voice command, which does nothing, and of course your volume controls and even your phone controls, but it's thick. It really is a thick, meaty steering wheel to hold on to. It feels really high quality, and I like the way they've incorporated these horn buttons as these two strips down the center, so you can push in the middle all you want. The horn's not going to beep. It's those little strips that are going to cause the honk. One issue you see always with these steering wheels is they start to peel up around the back here with the airbag, but that's pretty common, and quite honestly, you will never notice it unless I just pointed it out right there. Now the center stack is an area of the LR3 that still looks modern today because it's a very industrial design and it's very well thought out. Up top here you've got a couple of vital controls such as the hazards and the traction control button and then you get the radio which has these big chunky knobs for volume and tune and these buttons on the center for the phone keypad. All right that's looking a little bit old school and then you come to the climate control system which is really cool in its operation. First of all dual zone automatic climate but rather than having a little digital readout, you just have these little controls that allow you to pick a temperature. And then the auto function, check this out when I start the engine, the auto function illuminates as this little dial and these little orange buttons that extend across the uh, knob as you turn it. That's a nice design. One thing I wish we had right here was the option for heated seats, but this is kind of a entry level model for the US, so no heated seats. And we also don't have the heated steering wheel with the little lines in it. And then we get to this giant hole in the center of the dash, which looks totally out of place, but it's here for a reason, because if you spent more money in 2006, you could option this vehicle with a navigation system, and that would live right here in the center. It also showed you some cool off-road pages, but because this one doesn't have the navigation, what you get instead is this gaping cubby right in the center of the vehicle.
The other thing about the Land Rover LR3 is the seating position, which is perfect. It's, it's once again the best seating position in the industry because you sit up incredibly high relative to the belt line. It's called the command driving position and you sit on top of it. Modern day SUVs are trying to once again be sporty. You sit in them, you're nice and you're low and hunkered down like a sports car. The LR3 is like we're just going to place you on top of it like you're riding a skateboard but you can see the entire world. You sit above traffic. That is a great design that needs to come back. This is one of the coolest features by far of these old LR3s, the terrain response system. And nowadays it's pretty common to have rock modes and sand modes, but back in the early 2000s, no cars had it because Land Rover was the first to pioneer it and it works really well. So basically, you have a number of different modes ranging from normal to uh, ruts to rock crawl, and you can actually use this little dial to select the mode that you want. And then the vehicle will adjust the suspension, the traction control, and the center locking diff to get you through the best possible terrain possible based on what you dial in with this knob. And then you've got these funny little paddles over here. This right paddle controls the low range transfer case. This left paddle, which we already talked about, controls the air suspension. And this middle yellow button is for the hill descent control, another feature Land Rover pioneered on the Freelander. Nowadays, electronic parking brakes are pretty commonplace, but back in the mid 2000s, they were a little unusual. And this Land Rover has an electronic parking brake. To turn it on, you pull up. To turn it off, you put your foot on the brake and push down. But this was a very common failure point in Land Rover, so I wouldn't recommend using this one all that much. One aspect of these old Land Rovers I absolutely love are the individual armrests for both the driver and the passenger seat. And you use these little twisty knobs on the front of them to adjust their height so you can adjust them nice and low or if you're perhaps a little bit shorter you can adjust them nice and high if you like having your elbows way up in the air. This makes it extremely comfortable to get perfectly adjusted in both seats in this vehicle. Now Land Rovers are known for going a long distance off-road and if you're doing a little bit of what we call overlanding nowadays, you're probably going to want places to put things and the LR3 has you covered in spades. There are so many storage cubbies and pockets throughout. That big hole in the center of the dash, for example, is perfect for resting your phone for navigation as you drive along. You also have big cubbies up here on the passenger side and look at this, not one but two glove boxes, including a little pen clip. That's pretty thoughtful. Where this little mouse is, you've got another itty bitty cubby, and this would be a, a, a cup holder, which is decided to jam into the closed position. And then once again in the doors, more places to put more things. And there was even an option for a refrigerator in the center armrest. We don't have that, we just have another cubby, but if you want to keep your beverages cool, look for a high-end LR3. The LR3 has not one, not two, but three sunroofs. This is absurd, and they all have these little nets that you can use to block the sun. Note you can't completely eliminate the sun, but you can definitely block a little bit of the heat coming in. Only the front one opens, however, and it's pretty wild. If you look on top of the LR3, the back two are one continuous pane of glass, one massive piece of glass back there. Pretty advanced stuff for 2006. The Land Rover LR3 was codenamed Project Heartland, which is an interesting name. And back in the late 90s when BMW owned Land Rover, uh, the Land Rover Discovery was selling really well on the coasts of the US, but not selling so well in the central states of the US. They really wanted to target this vehicle at the middle of the United States, the heartland of the US, specifically going after the Jeep brand. And as such, this vehicle is off-road worthy. It's rugged, but it's also sophisticated and refined at the same time. One of the few cars, trucks, or SUVs in the world that is able to accomplish that and do it well. The old Discoveries are known for a couple of really special features, and one of the classic examples of that is the stepped up roof line. So you'll notice the roof line in the front is actually lower than the roof line in the rear, and that's on purpose because the rear seats sit higher than the front passengers. This is called stadium seating, and it makes road tripping in the back so much more fun because it feels like you're in control above the world. It's also supposed to reduce car sickness, but there's another feature back here 
The old Discoveries had something called Alpine windows in the roof, which added a little bit more light. The LR3 doesn't have them, but they kind of wanted to continue that heritage by adding this little extra bit of glass on the top of the rear quarter windows. Once again, it doesn't add any extra light, but it is a nice design. The back seat in an LR3 is just as good, if not better, than the front seat because, like I said, you sit so high above the rest of the vehicle. You also have these big, aggressive grab handles to hold on to. So, tons of room for rear seat occupants. And you'll notice something funny back here. These three little letters, AUX, this is actually the auxiliary port for the radio. For some reason, Land Rover decided to put this port nowhere near the front passengers or the radio or anywhere where you'd expect it to be. They decided to give it to the rear passengers just for, I don't know, giggles. Now from this angle, you can really see the stepped up roof in the rear of the LR3. It is dramatic. And you'll also notice this little panel here with these three circles. That's kind of a, a weird thing to have on the rear dome lights, but these were the controls for the optional um, second and third row AC and climate controls. Once again, this one doesn't have the AC for the rear seats, but it does have the three blanks just to remind you, you should have spent more to keep your kids comfy. Now you'll notice the word Discovery 3 on the back of this Land Rover. This is not actually correct because in the US, this vehicle was known as the LR3 and not Discovery, although in the rest of the world, this would have been correct. The reason this was called LR3 in the US is because well, the previous Discoveries had such a terrible reputation for reliability, Land Rover wanted to separate this new model from those old ones. So they got rid of the name Discovery altogether and then they brought it back actually on the current Discovery 5. And then on the right side of the tailgate you'll notice the letters and numbers V8 SE. V8 of course is the engine, but there was a 4 liter V6 available from the Ford Explorer, believe it or not. And then SE is the trim. SE is more toward the entry level trim here in the United States. The top end trims are called the HSEs. Those are going to be the ones with all the bells and whistles like the heated seats and the heated steering wheel and the navigation. And now we have to talk about the thing that all the comments are going to be going on about, the Land Rover reliability reputation. I get it, yes, there are people on the internet that will tell you to never buy a Land Rover. You are stupid if you buy this SUV. They make it sound like the second you drive a Land Rover off the showroom floor, it will explode. Like it will literally just combust into flames. Haha, <laughs> very funny, yes, I get it. Land Rover parts will fall off, whatever. The LR3 is surprisingly reliable. And there are two people in this world. There are people that like to make fun of Land Rovers and there are people that own Land Rovers. The people that actually own Land Rovers, especially the LR3s, if you talk to them, they're pretty solid. Certain models, like I mentioned, the Discovery 2s, the Freelanders with the automatic transmissions, they had faults within the vehicle that were fundamental failures. The LR3 was much better than those vehicles. There's really not one component that's going to leave you entirely stranded on the side of the road. For example, with the air suspension, they've got these little ride height position sensors and those are known to fail. Those can get you stuck on a trail because the suspension will collapse as the computer doesn't know what height it's riding at. But you can go out and buy one of these guys, which is this little tool that you plug into the OBD port and you can reset the air suspension and you can get yourself home. The Land Rover LR3 specifically can give you thousands of miles of trouble-free performance. So for example, uh, this one we bought with 130 some thousand miles, we put about 8,000 miles on it, now it has 142,000 miles, and in that, in that 8,000 miles we've driven it repeatedly off-road, we've towed with it, we've crashed it into things off-road. We did have a thermostat that failed, it failed open luckily, so the engine was underheating, threw a new one in there, and it just keeps chugging and chugging and chugging along. If something catastrophic fails, of course, we'll tell you about it, but I love it. I really, really love it. When equipped, the LR3 is rated to tow over 7,000 pounds. This one has a hitch on it that's rated at 5,000, and I have towed 5,000 pounds with this vehicle, and let me tell you what, it will do it, but it's not particularly happy. At 6,000 feet of elevation where we're at, the engine just screams. I mean, it'll hold five, 6,000 RPM for hours on end, but 
it's not all that happy. Now, funny enough, above the tow hitch, you'll notice a little panel. And when you peel back the panel, take a look at this. Right here, we have a factory recovery point on the LR3. This is proof that Land Rover was definitely not playing around when it came to off-roading. You'll notice a notch in the tailgate. And on the old Discoveries, this notch was to accommodate a spare tire. But on the LR3, it also serves an interesting purpose. First of all, to open up the rear, there's a little pad. And then you'll quickly figure out it's a split tailgate. So you've got a top portion and a bottom portion, which you can sit on and tailgate off of. That's great. But if you look above me, you'll notice this notch extends over this cutout on the tailgate. And when I'm out here after like a hike, if it's raining, if it's pouring down, rain, I can come under here, tie my shoe, change out like my, my boots or whatever, and I have a nice place where I'm going to stay dry. The LA3 was available in both two-row and three-row configurations. This one started life as a two-row, but the previous owner went ahead and put a third row in. It's kind of a faff to make it happen. I'll, uh, I'll let you kind of view the, uh, the experience. Now, the seat back actually folds up like that. But then to finish the process, I have to go in through this direction. Hang on. And then, let me see if I remember how to do this. This rear seat cushion, uh-huh. Ah, there we go. Does this little twirly thing and folds upward, and then I can climb in. Now, I'm quite sure if the LR3 was uh, equipped from the factory with the third row, this process would be easier. There'd be a mechanism just to pivot the seat out of the way. But actually the third row is pretty usable in this vehicle. And if you got a third row, you even got these funny little cubbies on both sides, which are just ginormous and headphone controls. How mid 2000s is that? So your kids in the way back could listen to their own tunes. There you have it, the Land Rover LR3, one of my favorite SUVs of all time. They are incredibly spacious, super comfortable, and will go just about everywhere you point them. Definitely consider buying one of these, and for five, six thousand dollars, they're a worthy investment. Are they gonna be as reliable as like a 4Runner? No! How about a Land Cruiser? Absolutely not! They are going to break more than those, but they're not gonna explode the second you drive them off the lot. They are not that bad, and if you shop smartly, you can find yourself a good one. Well, as always, this has been Tommy with the Fastlane Car. Head over to tflcar.com for the latest and greatest in new car reviews.